wanted to discuss on this uh, panel is that we're going to assume that you all have made a tremendous first film, maybe even a short, and that we're going to um, discuss how you're going to make your successful first feature. And with this first feature, you're going to have a producer. So we're going to talk to you this not on the creative side per se, we're going to assume we have the best script ever written by the best director ever to, be, uh, to, to make. So we're going to talk more about the business of film. And um, with that, um, we're just gonna go through a lot of things. Yeah, 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 wait. Uh, uh, we're gonna go through a lot of things that um, just may completely go over your head. You may not understand it today, even if we spent an hour just discussing one element. But what you just, what we're going to ask is that you're gonna, it's like a movie. You're not gonna freeze frame, we're not gonna stop for questions. We're just gonna go through it all, and at the end, you'll be able to ask questions. So um, let's get started, and let's have the panelists um, introduce themselves. Steven? Well, I'm Steven Adams, a manager pro producer from Los Angeles. I think some of you just heard from me a bit, so I won't repeat too much. But I, you know, I, on the acting side, we've already heard about, but I've also produced quite a bit. I've worked with Spike Lee a couple of times. I've done a lot of work in the visual effects world of things like Avatar, Thor, Life of Pi, and uh, a number of other indies. We had the closing night film here at this festival last year, Little Men, um, and um, off on all sorts of producing adventures right now. Uh, my name is Robert Patla. I'm a film and television executive from Los Angeles, uh, specifically acquisitions and distribution. So for a lot of you out here that are making films, I'm the guy that buys them and then puts them either in theaters or on Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, iTunes, you know, any OTT, SVOD, AVOD, you know, some of that means something to you, some of that doesn't. We're going to talk about what all those terms mean here in a second. But uh, I'm the one that usually watches your finished film and hopefully uh, helps you share it with the world. And I have a film here this weekend. Uh, Reggie is actually uh, in it. It's called Nola Circus. Uh, and that is uh, showing tonight at 8.30 and 10.30. Um, it's also in theaters in Los Angeles. So it'll be on iTunes starting next week. And Reggie doesn't know this, but he will now. Uh, it'll also be on Netflix, hopefully, uh, in 90 days. So nice. There you go. Um, and for the, uh, some of you that don't know me, um, my name is Carol Bido, and not only, uh, not only, but I am a producer um, that, and I do specialize in uh, financing and distribution of independent film. But I am also the president of Women in Film International. I mean. Louisiana, and on the board of Women in Film International. And we've got some brochures in the back, and we have a party going on today at, is it 5.30? At 5.30 here, so come join us. So let's get going. And um, I think the first thing we wanted, we had sort of like a rehearsal yesterday, and we had um, a, a local uh, filmmaker that was uh, sitting with us. And I think that we can um, safely say that she felt overwhelmed with the information that we were just bantering about. But it is so important, really, people, this is really the important, because this is the information that gets your film out to an audience, not just to your friends, not to your family, but it gets it out there. So maybe the first question, like, um, again, I'm going to be like you. I'm going to be that young producer. Yes, young. Um, that producer out there that I'm on my first film and I've just, I have an opportunity to, I've locked these two guys into a room and they've got to make me a deal, but I've got to, I've got to give it to them. So we're going to walk it through. So what's, um, you know, most producers and most directors, my, my dream team are, you know, my friends and, you know, some writers that I may know. What do you think, as a producer, should be my best, my dream team? Sure, I, I think, uh, you know, Stephen might be better uh, equipped to answer that question in terms of putting together your, your team and your budget and laying the foundation. I think he might be able to right, speak a little bit away. to that. So I think, you know, with, with, um, when, you, when, you get, when you get to the great, as you said, the great script that you're in love with, the first thing I do then is get the thing budgeted, and scheduled, 
because from the budget grows everything. You question the budget, you ask if it, you always ask if it can be done for less money, what can I do that could bring this department down, that department down, that department down, because, you know, and we're gonna get to the reasons why a little bit later, but, you know, well, I can say this right now from the top. The market is oversaturated with film right now, so the responsible thing to do is try to get the thing made for as little money as possible, to, to mitigate risk at every opportunity you can, and that starts, uh, with being very responsible with your budget and being responsible to your investor. Whether that's a studio or a private investor, you want to, at every step you can, take as little risk with their money as you can. So you take a really good look at that budget, you bring those departments down, you figure out what you can get for free, you schedule this thing, and then you start looking at where this could go. Um, before you even start asking for money, I always advise the people do a Kickstarter campaign. The Kickstarter campaign will inform you of a few things. You look at this thing, you look at the script and you go, who is the ideal audience for the script? Let's say it's about um, struggling young graffiti artist. There's an audience for that and you have to find a way to connect with those people. And that is what the Kickstarter forces you to do. And it also, forces, it also creates an audience. So by the time you're finished, let's say you, you have, you run a successful campaign and you've built up 10,000 followers. When you get that money and you start fulfilling all those things, you can go to someone like this gentleman and say, listen, I already have 10,000 people that want to see this movie, that have put money into my hands, and he can do some calculations and figure out how, what, might be, what kind of business might be done. So that's a very good place to start. A lawyer. You have to have a good lawyer to make sure your contracts are airtight. Sloppy business, there's no excuse for it. I don't care how much you want to make a film and skip the steps. The detail, the devil, the, you know how they always say the devil's in the details? He is. He really is in there. You can have one undone clause that can screw up your entire process. So make sure that all, you, and also the other thing I want to say about that, and I don't want to get too far off topic, but force yourself to read those contracts learn them, even if it seems like Martian right now, make that lawyer make you understand every single clause before you put your signature on it. Because if you don't understand it, it doesn't matter in the court of law, you are still responsible for what it says, and somebody else does know exactly what it says. So really, make that lawyer earn his money or her money. Shake that knowledge out of them and make sure you don't get to the, the second paragraph before you understand the first one. I think the, the next team member I would want is somebody who is very good at accounting so that your money is meticulously looked after, that you can give financial reports to your investors at any time before you spend, if you spend a dime, it's justified, it relates to that budget, it has a line item, and it's clear. So these are the, these are the team, team members I would want in, in, in place first. The key to any next-gen recoil rig is balance while keeping your rig short and light. Your eye, shoulder, and hand placement never change, so the key is to slide the camera as far back as needed to achieve the perfect balance. This forces your EVF and camera control forward, but our unique VCT base plate design gives you extra rod space, making it possible to mount accessories close to the camera body, allowing for a perfectly balanced recoil rig. The next-gen recoil's adjustability is great enough to balance any size camera with any size lens and any additional accessories, and its quick releasability makes set up and break down fast and effortless. And then while you're laying that groundwork, I know this is gonna sound very basic and elementary, but like social media, you know, it's, it's so important from the outset. And you know, we're gonna talk a little bit later about, you know, the kinds of distribution services that I can offer as compared to trying to self, or as compared to trying to self-distribute. And either way, having that growing population of people who are innately attracted to your film and your, and your movement and have that grow and snowball. When you get to later phases, again, the things we're going to talk about here, but when you get to the festival circuit, if you've been growing your social media off and, uh, uh, social media following since pre-production, since you know, your Kickstarter and through on through production and all that stuff, you know, then you come with a following by the time you hit that festival circuit and that just continues to grow. So you know, again, we'll get to that, but one of the things I would definitely recommend is just canvassing the social media you know, uh, cloud or whatever you want to call the social, all social media platforms, make sure you get set up, you know, come up with some creative name for your film and stuff like that, stick with it, get a hashtag, sounds basic and elementary, but the further along you get in the process, you'll be glad you did early on. 
So, I've done my Kickstarter campaign magically, and I did fantastically. I'm so proud of you. I got it. <laughs> and now, because I've listened to these guys, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a time warp here. Come on, believe. There's suspension of disbelief on this panel. So, I have now 25 thousand social fo uh, media followers because I listen to these guys. So now, um, I, you know, remember, I've got, I really do have the greatest film and, um, and script. So do I just um, assume that the market, um, you know, is going to be ready for my film? So can we sort of get into understanding the market that we're going to be um, Sure. Sure. Uh, quick story, I went to go get my hair cut one day, and the guy said, hey man, I got this script about this cross-gender Thai kickboxer that solves crimes. I'm like, man, it's like cut my hair, like a half to a one against the grain, you know. But all that to say, like, everybody has a story to tell. Everybody thinks that theirs is important, it's their baby, it's the best thing since sliced bread, and I get that. But understand the market. Okay, you like horror movies, got you what sort of horror movies are being bought and sold right now? What's the trend? What, is it more jump scares? Is it blood and guts? Is it psychological thriller? You know, what, what's out there that looks like yours, feels like yours? Maybe there's not, but figure out what's selling. And then, past figure out what's selling, where are the films that you like in this vertical? Where are they living? Are they on OTT platforms like Chiller or and Screamfest and Bloody Disco, like stuff like that? Are they on the Hulus and Amazons? Are they on network TV? And if so, which networks and what other kinds of programmings do these networks offer? Really do your homework on not just I want to make something, like that's great. Have the foresight to consider who's going to buy it, where's it going to live? And, and think about that as, as you go through your creative process. No, that's great. No, no, I was just agreeing. I love, I, I think that's great advice. I think, you know, I mean, we can, I guess the next step would really be, you know, casting. Uh, well, I mean, oh, yeah, I'm just right, gonna say, right. you know, if you're gonna, you, you know, you can sometimes get finance without a cast, but it's probably rare. Um, if you're not someone who's part of the system in Hollywood, then you need to partner with somebody who is. Because there has to be some kind of credibility, there has to be some kind of accountability from, uh, you know, from somebody on that team that gives these guys assurance. I mean, you know, if you sit in a talent agency, there's a misconception that people are uh, unkind, that they're hostile, that they're challenging. And they are challenging, but every question they ask is a question you should be able to answer. You should not be able, you should go through a checklist. Just put yourself in the position of, a, of an agent that represents a lot of movie stars. There's probably 10 agencies in all of Hollywood that have most of them, and, and probably most of them are concentrated in three. Um, everybody in the whole world is after these people. So when you want their time, you need to answer every question they're gonna ask. Is your financing in place? No, be honest about that. I know sometimes people tell, tell agents, yeah, I have financing when they don't, as if that's gonna magically make you know, uh, Will Smith jump into their picture. You gotta show that if you have that money, then you're gonna show that it's sitting in a, an account somewhere, and that account can be verified, and then trust me, that guy's gonna make that phone call, because he's not gonna, he or she is not gonna put their client on a set without knowing that money's there, and the next step you're gonna do is put money into their account for that actor before they set foot on your set. So all those things, you have to be ready for all of that. If you're not ready for that, just be clear about where you are. If the script is good, someone's gonna eventually understand that it's good and, and it, you'll have that breakthrough. There is again that thing about just persistence. But I would say, you know, find way, ways to partner with people who are in the system. You know, producers who are, have taste the way he's talking about, like if you know somebody likes a genre, go to that guy. Partner with him or that girl. Partner with them and then, then go into Hollywood. Don't, don't, don't be so egocentric that it has to all be about you. It's better to get into a partnership and land where you want to be than keep it all for yourself and sit in your, in your place and not get anything done. So those are, those are my advice. So, you know, much in those tracks he's talking about, you can figure out a lot of other things, like my potential partners, my, uh, these guys may have a relationship with cast already, which will make that easier. So even, even better if you've got an interesting star or two attached before you go to an agency. 
and then you're even in a more powerful position. So, you know, look, look at the whole world. It's all, the, all that information is so easy to get now. You know, we were saying yesterday, it used to be a very closed shop. You didn't know who did what. Now I can just click on a button. If I'm sitting in the middle of Cincinnati, Ohio, I can still find out who in Hollywood represents the people that I love and find a way to and go through that resume and who's worked with them. You might even know, you know, you keep breaking that down, you might find a pathway that's sitting in your hand already. So, you know, really break this stuff down for yourself. I think, I think that's actually a, a really good segue in, into another topic. Uh, understanding the market and then, you know, also like he said, kind of reaching out and, and partnering people that have like minds. I also want to add on to that, you know, and I said a couple of these terms earlier, so now I'm going to talk about them a little bit more in depth, but the game is changing, you know, the, 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 the entertainment landscape is shifting, obviously with the exponential evolution of technology. It's getting easier and easier for people to create their own content. No longer do you need a whole sound studio in an edit bay, like you have your smartphone. You know, there's films like uh, Tangerine, which I believe was at Sundance a couple years ago that was shot on an iPhone. Uh, you know, I was telling, uh, and, and which, which sold to Netflix. Uh, I was telling my, colleague, or my colleagues uh, at lunch the other day, there was a film at Cannes a few years back called Colin that was made for 35 pounds, the equivalent of $70, always used on makeup and blood, but it was about the transformation. A kid just got bit by a zombie, and the whole hour and a half of the movie was the first hour and a half of like becoming a zombie. He doesn't bite anybody, he doesn't eat anybody, doesn't even leave his house. But can, can you imagine what it was like to become a zombie? Like that was that look, that slice, and it cost him 35 pounds. So I say that all to say, you know, understand the market and understand how these landscapes are shifting, right? Like just because you want to make a movie doesn't mean it's going to go on 2,200 screens and a wide release and you don't have to spend $50 million on publicity and advertising, right? You know, you guys, how do you guys watch content? You watch Netflix, you watch Amazon, you watch Hulu, you watch all these OTT platforms or like video on demand services, right? You don't even, gone are the days of being in front of your TV at 7 p.m. to watch Law and Order. Like, you know, y'all might be there for Scandal. I get it, like live. You can't be on black Twitter and not have watched Scandal live. Like, I get it, like there are still events you know, kind of TV and stuff like that. But for the most part, you watch what you want, where you want, how you want, in the comfort of your home, your bathroom, the train, wherever. So when you're making your content, don't just think so linear, like it has to be on traditional television or the daunting task of having to put it in theaters because that's, there's, there's over 4,000 different television shows right now, just FYI, between reality and scripted. And there's a plethora of platforms that have to support that content. So whether it's Curiosity Stream, which is if you love documentaries, go there, or Acorn TV, do you love British comedies? Or you know, Urban Movie Channel, you wanna watch old Wesley Snipes films? Like whatever you like, there is an OTT platform, a vertical, a niche just for you. And I'm 100% positive that whatever you wanna make from a content perspective, there is an audience out there but just understand the digital landscape, and go find it. And then sometimes like the, the barrier to entry to some of, again, the Amazons, the Hulus, the Netflix, barrier of entry, still very high. But some of these other OTT platforms are, that are formed, like YouTube Red and Verizon Go 90, and you know, even Vimeo is getting into original content. The barrier for entry at some of those OTT platforms and a myriad of others is a little bit lower, you know, and, and they're willing to take chances on unique content because they need to keep their viewers there. So just understand that don't be daunted by the, you know, having to be on TV and, and getting, you know, having to get an agent and having to be in Hollywood and box office. Like, it doesn't have to be that route. Understand that, study it, know it. Yeah, and I wanted to add a little bit more because you know, you're bringing up some very good points. Before you commit to a cast, you need to have that cast evaluated by someone like this gentleman you know, who, who will tell you the value of that person in the marketplace or the aggregate value of the proposed cash you're thinking about. Because you may be thinking, I need $5 million, and he's gonna tell you, actually, I'm gonna give you about 250000 That's a big reality check, and that happens a lot. And as you're saying, with all of the uh, opportunities to make films now, and they're so easy, it has raised the bar in terms of what is needed in terms of artfulness, but it's also pushed down the value because there is a super abundance of material. And so you've got to really study that market from that point as well. Your budget has to make sense 
in the long run when you're actually dealing with sales and distribution and knowing what you know comparable films you're going to see okay that film that's just like mine grossed seven hundred fifty thousand dollars so why am i making it for two million it doesn't make any sense it's irresponsible to your investor it may be more comfortable for you in the short run but you probably won't it'll probably be very hard for you to make another movie when your reputation is that of having squandered 1.25 Five million, and, and and I'll say, look, you know, uh, and then it goes back to the technology, you know, point. But everything that Stephen said used to be hearsay and whispers, and you know, you only really got that information if you were in L.A. or you were in New York or you were within, you know, an, an earshot of some agents talking. But now, again, the evolution of technology, it's at the touch of your fingers. You can pull up how much a film sold for, how much its budget was. You can pull up what cast is working on what. You can pull up. What is UP, you know, UPN? What is Fox? What is HBO Showtime? What is Funny or Die? What are they looking for? There's articles on that. You know, all of that information that used to be uh, restricted to agents and managers and assistants and all that stuff, it's out there. You just have to make the conscious effort to, instead of being on Twitter and Instagram, like find the trades, read Hollywood Reporter and IndieWire and Variety. You know, don't read about what Kim Kardashian's, you know, wearing. Read about the business side of what's selling and who's buying. Like, that's what's going to make you a savvy filmmaker. And, you know, frankly, then when you sit down with a person like me, like, it, may, I, it shows me that you've put the work in and that you know what you're talking about. Um, I, you know, so it's only fair, right? Okay, so I've done my homework. I've been looking at the trades, reading about it, and I know basically that you know what I can uh, mark the market will bear for my film, and I can make it for less. We're not going to say what that is because it's just a number. Um, I also, as a producer, or let's just say I'm a first-time producer, I really need to try, at least for my investors, to try to get a sales agent. So how, um, you know, can I go about, because my film is probably, if we're making it in Louisiana, maybe I'll have a strong lead role, but not the lead roles of a known actor. Um, and probably I'm going to be working with people that maybe a Gus Van Sant discovered, or, you know, but they're not Brad Pitt. So, how do I get a sales agent for my film? It's a small film. It's a film that doesn't have the big stars, but I do think I can make it for uh, a number that the market will bear. Uh, I, I, well, I, again, there's two answers. I'm going to let Stephen go first, just because, first of all, I'm sure a lot of you are like, what is a sales agent? And that's just, right. and that's just somebody who essentially helps you get your film to people like me. So the average person in here, probably doesn't have my cell phone number and can't call me directly, so who does is most sales agents. And so that's the, like, that's the buffer for us, and they vet you know, filmmakers, essentially. So there are different ways to get a sales agent. I just want to say a sales agent's job is to get your film in front of distributors and help leverage um, you know, the assets that you have into a sale. So I think Steven's going to talk about the angle of getting a sales agent before you've made your film, and then I'll talk about maybe like the benefits and how to get a sales agent after you've, in a scenario where you've already made your film. I always believe in getting to a sales agent in advance because I, I am risk averse and I think that is the best way to be in filmmaking. Uh, because there's gonna be, in nat there's naturally occurring happenstances anyway. Because we, it just is the nature of the beast. But if, you're, if your mind is always on mitigating risk and the first place to mitigate risk is in your budget, then as I said earlier, I wanna know that, that the people I'm thinking about have a value that makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, then we have to, re we have to rethink that. 
But partnering with someone who says, yeah, I get this vision, I'm down with what you're trying to do, but I'm gonna suggest that you actually go in this direction with this, this cast will save you a lot of heartache. And you don't have to try to justify yourself after the fact or find a way to beat the bushes to make the money that is gonna be fairly hard, fairly difficult to make. But I think you know, going in with a really attractive uh, package that shows that you've done all the efforts that we talked about before is the way to go in the door. I don't want to, I don't want to just go in with a script. I want to go in with some, with some momentum happening. Um, and again, if you're not someone who knows those people, I, I repeat myself, you know, partner, it's all about that. Get somebody who has the relationships and go under their wing and learn from them and, and don't have an ego about it. Um, and then when you've got that vetted cast and you start attaching people, then you can go after your, your money. And it's going to show somebody, okay, I've got, I've done my Kickstarter, I've raised some seed money, I've been able to do a beautiful package, I've paid for this budget that makes sense, it's been vetted by these people, I've got my lawyer in place, I've got my accountant, I've got a sales agent who's going to look after your investment, please now give me my money that we know makes sense to the marketplace. And that is a, a good and very logical way to go after investors. And I think even with investors, it's, they're, they can be, you know, they're, they're like, Foxes running through the bush, you know. If you are, you you might want to find somebody who's very good at. I know people who just follow money. Great partners, great partners to have, and you know some people have a knack for it. Yeah, you need to meet so and so. <laughs> Come this way, and they're your they're your producing partner because they're going to get their five percent, and you should not begrudge them that because, and fa oh by the way, factor that finder's fee into your budget. If you're going to give away five percent you gotta know that that's coming out of your money up front. Don't be surprised by that. That's, it happens a lot of times. But how do we afford that? I'm like, you gotta think about that, you know, up in advance. Okay, so now I'll, I'll kind of attack that same question from let's say you made your movie, it's done, and it's like, what, what, what the hell do I do with it now? Like I live, in, I live in Baton Rouge, like how do I get anybody to see my film? What do I do with it? Okay, so again, the, Homework is a big part of it, right? Like, so what is a sales agent? What are the sales agencies? You know, I'll give you a couple that we work with that I recommend, uh, Submarine Entertainment, um, uh, Ramos Law, Content Films, Preferred Content. Um, those are some synetic, but companies like that all have hungry, young, you know, you may not get the top dog. You know, if you, if you send a cold turkey to a, co a top, one of the top agents or whatever, yeah, they, it may not get to them. But they have assistants, they have coordinators, they have junior executives who are hungry, who are thirsty. I mean, by the nature of the entertainment industry, that's, that's, that's what we hire. We want those tenacious, you know, attitudes. So there are young go-getters who are willing to screen and vet. It's just, just, like, the, just like the record industry, you know. Uh, Barry Gordy might not get your CD right away, but his assistant is, and his assistant is dying to find that jewel, that diamond in the rough. So identify some, you know, again, maybe not the top talent agencies that have film departments, maybe not CAA and WME and ICM, but the sales, the specific sales agencies. Go find those, you know, again, it's a little bit of research. Go on LinkedIn, Google preferred, you know, LinkedIn preferred content junior executive, like whatever, get creative, you can get names, you can call. So that's one, that, like that's one avenue. But let's say, for whatever reason, that doesn't pan out. The other way to go about it with your finished film to build awareness to get it in front of people is events like the Louisiana International Film Festival, right? So what are the major film festivals? Ah, there's Cannes, there's Toronto, there's Berlin, there's Tribeca, South by, Sundance, right? Um, but after that, after that, there isn't really like a second to like, those are the majors. And after that, every state has a Louisiana International Film Festival. There's the Milwaukee Film Festival, there's the San Francisco Black Film Festival, there's the Tennessee, there's the Nashville Film Festival, Chicago Film, Philadelphia, Baltimore, any city that you can think of is trying to build and foster a community of filmmakers. Um, and, and especially states that are having good and growing tax incentive uh, situations, you know what I'm saying? Uh, go just figure out where these little festivals are, because again, you may not be able to get in to the majors, but you know, look how many people are here. You know, for you know, for this panel, and look at the you know, look at the growing population just here at Lyft, and look, you have people from LA who come out, who care about the community, who are willing to have these conversations. Um, assume that that happens in each one of these states. Submit your film to those states. Is your film about? 
you know, Black Lives Matter, okay, go ask a, the Baltimore Film Festival, Chicago Film Festival, Indiana Film, go find those cities where those issues are relevant. Is it, are, is it about farming in the dairy land? Okay, go hit the Nebraska Film Festival in Wisconsin. That's the way you have to be thinking. Go find your audience, it's out there, it's growing, and that's how you get, because you know, once you have, once you can put on your poster or your email to me that it's been in San Francisco, and so I may not see Toronto South by Sundance, that's fine. If I see Louisiana, Milwaukee, Chicago, Baltimore, DC, I, you, you put in your work, I see it. I see that people have liked this film, it's worth my time. So that's some of the legwork that you can do. Don't be intimidated by just the majors, because there are Louisiana International Film Festivals all over the place with people who will care about your work, and that's how you build up a little bit of a resume, a little bit of a crowd, and for each one you're in, remember that social media following we were talking about? For every festival you put it in now, now that, fo that following is compounding, it's growing. So again, by the time either you get to me, or if you never get to me and you do it yourself, you've now grassrooted your own following and your own marketing. Now, if your Twitter is gone from 10 to 25, but now you've been in five, six, seven festivals, now it's at 50K, that's 50,000 people that you can now reach at the drop of a dime to say whatever the hell you want to say about whatever you want to say, right? So that's very powerful uh, when you start talking about spreading the word about your film. So that's kind of how all these steps continue to compound and build on each other. You know, you, you, you reminded me of something else that we talked about yesterday, which I think is very important, which is that there are a number of institutions like Sundance and like the San Francisco Film Society, which very famously supported Beasts of the Southern Wild. Um, there are these things all over the country and sometimes all over the world, depending on what your subject matter is. And there are people who also have organizations who might want to support your subject matter. And that also is a hallmark of distinction. If I know something came from San Francisco, San Francisco Film Society or Sundance, it's going to catch my attention, as it would anybody in the business. Because something that's been vetted by a system, or even funded by a system, for its development is significant. So that is something else that you can do for yourself. It doesn't matter where you are. You know, you're, you're on an equal footing with anybody in this country. You just have to make that effort as well. So you may find yourself with 25K or 5K, or you get flown out you and your group gets flown out to do some development on your project, and that, those, those steps give you distinction as well and set you aside from people who haven't made those efforts. So, um, Stephen, Robert, I've listened to everything you're telling me, and guess what? Um, I got into to talk to a sales agent, but now they're talking to me about you know, one of them says that he doesn't want to give me an MG, and the other one says that they're going to give me a, a, an MG, and the, the other one's telling me about bifurcating my rights, and the other one's going to tell me about, um, you know, I just under, you know, just tell me, give me a two second crash course on what are the basic terms of this, that I need to know about this sales agent. And mark my word, my uncle, is a really great um, entertainment lawyer, but he's gone, he's on his yacht. But I need, to, I need to get this deal going. So just give me a crash course right now on what the hell he's talking about. Sure, so, so again, let's just assume in this process you've made your film, let's say you got a sales agent, right? Or you, you got a sales, well, either you got a sales agent or you didn't get a sales agent, because the sales agent's just gonna negotiate for you, right? Sales agent's gonna come talk to me and I'm gonna break down all those things that she was talking about to the sales agent, but if you, so if you have a sales agent or if you don't, and you happen to be the one sitting across from me, you definitely should understand um, what some of this stuff means as you look at it so that you don't get taken advantage of, right? So I'll just kind of talk to you about when, you know, if I find a film that I like, um, I'll kind of just walk you through what the basic terms that I would offer and what they mean, and um, yeah. So the first thing, you know, I wanna figure out are, are, are all rights available? Right? And that means for any piece of content you make, let's say you made a film or a documentary, feature a documentary, 
You know, where are the places that this can live? It can live on television, it can live in theaters, it can live on DVD, it can live in the digital world, and it could live on any number of things that haven't been invented yet that could, you know, pop up tomorrow, right? So when I'm coming to acquire your film, I want all of the rights. No questions. I don't want just. To, there may be situations where I look at it and say, ah, you know what? I just I don't think there's a theatrical business for this. So if you want to keep the theatrical rights, that's fine, and I'll take the rest of them. Um, but most times, I just want to cover the whole nut, and I'm just going to say, you know what? I want all the rights. I want the right to exploit this in any window or any opportunity that I can, you know, make happen. Then it's how long. Oh, I, I guess in that sense. So. She had mentioned bifurcating rights, right? And it sounds like kind of a weird word, but all it means is, so let's say you, went, you were at a film festival with your film and Showtime or Lifetime, Lifetime really likes it a lot, right? It's a, it's, it's a woman-centric film about a strong woman who overcomes adversity and yeah. So uh, Lifetime really wants it. You're at the film festival and a Lifetime rep comes up to you. You don't have a sales agent. You may not know better, right? But a Lifetime rep comes up to you and says, hey, I really like your film, uh, you know, I'd, I'd love to give you 100, you know, 150K, I'd love to give you 100K for it, right? Like, to you, you're like, man, that sounds great. Like, 100K for my movie, like, done, sold. L L Lifetime, it's on TV, let's roll. Because as a first-time filmmaker, that's very attractive, and I get that. But think about all the, the options that I just told you that a film could live, TV, digital. And when I say digital, I mean video, VOD in several different forms, right? VOD just means video on demand. There's SVOD, which means subscription-based, right? Who here has like a Netflix or an Amazon account? Hands. That's subscription-based. So for a monthly fee, you can watch whatever you want, whenever you want, however many times you want. How many people used to use Hulu when it was free? Okay, that's AVOD, that's, that's ad-based VOD. So you can watch it for free, you don't have to pay for it, but you have to sit through the ads, right? Then there's TVOD, transactional VOD. You can buy it whenever you want and watch it whenever you want, right? But you have to buy it singularly that, just that film. So as you can see, there's all sorts of different ways to exploit it in the digital realm, right? And theatrically, who knows? Maybe there's, maybe there's a little bit of money to be had there, maybe not. But once you go and sell, for example, that one window, and that's what they're called, each one of those things are called a window. Once you go sell that window yourself, I am no longer interested because that sale, that TV sale, that first window exclusive, right? That's about 80% of the money you're gonna see from that film. So whether 100K was a good price or not, um, you've essentially taken 100K for just TV and have lost out, unless you have personal relationships with theaters, unless you have personal relationships with Netflix and Amazon, then you've essentially carved out a piece that makes it no longer sexy for me. Because what I'm going to do, I can do the same. If, if you come to me and say, hey, Lifetime came to me at the film festival, that actually makes it more interesting for me. It makes, it makes me think that, yes, there's a business with this film. OK, cool, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to call Life, Lifetime. I'm going to say, OK, well, you can have it for 150 or two, or Netflix is going to take it for 150. We, uh, so I work for Accelerator Media. We sell, on average, nine films every quarter to Netflix. We have a great relationship with them, right? So we're able to leverage these deals against the partners that we have to get the best price for the first window. But after the first window, we're also going to put it on iTunes, Amazon, Google Play, and Crackle. We're going to make sure it's available for transaction. We're going to set up a whole release. We're going to put it in a couple theaters, for like marketing, and then we're gonna make it available on iTunes, day and date. After 90 days, boom, it comes up on Netflix for two, three years. Comes off Netflix, we're gonna put it on, what do we say, Lifetime? Then it goes on Lifetime in a secondary window for another 50K. After that, we're gonna put it on an OTT platform where it lives in perpetuity for the license. That's what somebody like me can do for your film if you let me leverage each one of those angles. But if you take it upon yourself and you just sell that one, uh, it's, it's not really interesting to me anymore. So that's when I say to you, I want all rights so that I can maximize the revenue stream as much as possible. I think that like motion picture is probably one of the most powerful ways you can communicate a message. You know, I think 10 years ago, if you didn't have massive, massive budgets, you were severely limited 
on the quality of story that you could tell based off of the music that you had access to. That to me is what Music Bed changed, is it made the best artists in the world available to hundreds of thousands of filmmakers. And that hasn't really existed before. What we've done is created a platform to allow the creatives to be making the choice of who wins. I mean, that's been one of the most fulfilling things for us is watching hundreds of artists just almost begin to dream at another level. Um, sorry, so that's, that's the rights. I want all rights. Term, basically the term is just how long I'm gonna license your film for. I like to say in my offers, about 12 to 20 years, 12, 15 years. Because look at everything I just said. That's at least what I just said is at least a five to seven year plan for your film, right? Three, uh, you know, a year TVOD, three years on Netflix, two years on TV, another two, three years on OTT. Like that's a, that's a five, seven year plan for your film. So I can't only have your film for five years. I need to have your film for 12 to 15 years, the rights to work with it um, so that I can do what I need to do. Um, then it comes to territory, right? So I need, we take global rights and we take territory rights, meaning if I think that your film can be impactful in London, in Spain, like is it a sports film? Is it a soccer film? Soccer documentary, perfect. Perfect in the States, translates to Spain, to Italy, to Greece, to Africa, Australia, there's soccer everywhere. That's a global acquisition for me. Um, a rapper, a rapper from Atlanta, ash, 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 ashes to classy or rags to riches, that's a domestic play. London doesn't care about our hip hop scene. Spain doesn't care about what happens in Atlanta. Italy has no idea who Gucci Man is. You know what I'm saying? So when I'm looking at the different titles, I'm trying to figure out, okay, well, which territory do I want? Um, so that'll be spelled out. Do I want North America? Do I want North America and Latin America? Do I want global rights? And then again, we sell either global rights or territory rights to whoever we're working with. Um, after that, then we can talk about an MG. And an MG is just an abbreviation for minimum guarantee. Um, and it's upfront money. And who doesn't love upfront money, right? Um, it's, very, it's very similar to a, a record label advance, right? So it's money that they give you from the outset, but it is recoupable, which means you need to pay that back. And not necessarily out of your pocket, but if I give you $50,000 for your film, or if I pay you $100,000 for your film, then when I sell it to Netflix or Amazon for 150K, I'm, I'm recouping whatever I paid you, that 100K, I gotta make that back before we get to the back end. And the back end is just, so once we've paid out the distribution expenses, and once I've, we've recouped whatever the MG was, and whatever the uh, you know, marketing budget was for the film, once all that money has been made back, I have a deal with you, the filmmaker, that any money that's made past that, we're gonna split somehow. I usually start at 50-50, but if you're a savvy negotiator, you could probably give me the 70-30, bend my arm, maybe, you know? But those are things you have to be able to come back with, like say, hey, no, I want, you know, I, I want a, you know, maybe more of an MG, but less back end. Or sometimes, I, in, in some films, and it's just the way it goes, sometimes there's no money up front, but I'll give you a lot, a bigger piece of the back end because we're gonna get there quicker. But I'm not as confident that it's, it's gonna sell for a whole lot up front. So there's pros and cons, I think, to each. Um, and understanding that, and, and understanding that any money you take is, is gonna be paid back, you know, eventually in some capacity. But it always, it's good to get an MG, but also understand, because I read a lot of articles that uh, kind of poo-poo on uh, no MG offers, and I get that, but for first time filmmakers, Sometimes it's not always about the large upfront check sum. It's about the world seeing your film, you know, for the first one. And then you leverage, next time when you go to make your second film, you can say, hey, you can see my film on Netflix, or hey, it's on HBO right now. So you may have not got a whole lot for that first one, but it allows you to have a stepping stone for the next opportunity. 
Um, and then let's see, so I think, I think those are pretty much the, the basic terms of, of my agreement. So the territory, uh, what kind of rights, term length, MG or no MG, the profit participation on the back end, those are the basic basics of any offer that you're gonna get for your film. This is our durability test number two. We're gonna run over this gradical eye with Jens's Jeep. Come over here and take a look. I want you to see the picture. Can you see the picture? Okay, here we go. You see an image in there? That's strong. 